everyone across the country and wherever you may be and um, hello everyone um, here participating in the panel. I'm pleased to welcome you to today's Faculty of Law webinar. My name is Jutta Brunet. I'm the Metcalf Chair in Environmental Law at the Uni University of Toronto Faculty of Law. The Faculty of Law is the oldest professional faculty at the University of Toronto, one of the world's, world's leading research intensive universities. Now, before we begin, I would like to acknowledge the land on which the university operates. For thousands of years, it has been the traditional land of the Huron-Wendat, the Seneca, and most recently, the Mississaugas of the Credit River. This meeting place is still the home to many indigenous people from across Turtle Island, and we are grateful to have the opportunity to work on this land. And now I'm delighted to introduce to you two of my international law colleagues who will participate with us today in the discussion. Lavanya Rajamani is Professor of International Environmental Law at the Faculty of Law at Oxford University. Lavanya writes, teaches and advises on international environmental law and in particular international climate change law. In fact, she's one of the world's leading experts on international climate law. Her latest book is entitled Innovation and Experimentation in the International Climate Change Regime. It's based on a special course she delivered at the Hague Academy of International Law last year and was published in March of this year. Alonso Gomendi is assistant professor at Universidad del Pacifico in Lima, Peru, where he specializes in international humanitarian law and the international law and the use of force with a particular focus on the history of international law. He's currently also a PhD candidate at the University College London, where he's conducting research on the history of the principle of military necessity. He's also visiting professor at the University of Michigan, teaching online, as many of us uh, do these days, and he's a contributing editor of the influential international law blog, Opinio Juris. So if one thing or the other that we're discussing here today um, uh, strikes a chord with you, that is a good go-to source uh, to get all kinds of current debates on international law. Now, if you have a question during the presentation, you can submit your question using the Q&A function at the bottom of your screen. The questions are then held until all the presentations conclude. And I'd like to use this moment to thank one of our fantastic doctoral students here at the University of Toronto, Sarah Mason Case, for acting as the Q&A moderator today. So, um, with this preface, I will change hats to um, put on the panelist hat. Um, the deliberately provocative title for our discussion about international law today is 2020, Everything Changes. Now, I happen to think that 2020 is a decisive year for the world and for international law. I'd suggest that not in a hundred years, think World War I, the Spanish flu, the Great Depression, has the world seen as many crises converging as we see now. There's plenty of reason to be deeply worried. And I'll talk about some of those reasons, but then I actually want to sound a note of optimism and highlight some of the reasons why 2020 might be a harbinger for change for the better. Now, one ought to be careful in pronouncing on world-changing events or turning points. Remember the Berlin Wall, the fall of the Berlin Wall in 1989? Having grown up in Germany and watching TV as East Germans began to pour across the border to the West, I can attest that it was a momentous event and many things did change in Germany and around the world. The end of the Cold War followed Western-style democracy seemed to be on the roll, such that some commentators even pronounced the end of history. You might recall Francis Fukuyama's uh, famous uh, book at the time. And then uh, at the time, President, uh, United States President George Bush I saw even the rise of a new world order, where the UN's collective security system, established at the end of World War II, finally seemed to function as intended. And around the same time, also the United Nations Framework Convention on Climate Change was adopted. Well, 1989 was neither the end of history nor the beginning of a new world order. As we know only too well today, democracy did not take over the world. The Security Council reverted to veto-induced paralysis. And some 30 years later, we still have not turned the corner on climate change, far from it. And yet again, after the terrorist attacks on, of 9-11, 2001, 
pundits claimed that the world had changed forever. Did it? In some respects, yes. Aside from the sheer scale of the attack, new was the fact that a non-state group was able to deliver such a devastating strike and that it occurred inside the United States. But of course, the breeding ground for the attack had been long in the making, arguably connecting all the way back to the lingering effects of colonialism, the ongoing Western interventionism in resource-rich or geopolitically important regions, and Western economic expansionism. And then the response to 9-11, notably from the United States and the United Kingdom, built right onto these developments with interventions in Afghanistan, Iraq, and so on. And so when I say that 2020 may be a genuine turning point, you might be inclined to say simply, well, things change and they remain the same. That's true, of course, but still, first of all, I'd suggest that 2020 is different from the other two world change markers that I mentioned. Although the year will forever be associated with COVID-19, unlike 1989 and 2001, 2020 is not about a single event. It marks, in my view, the culmination of what has been brewing for some time. And 1989 and 2001 are actually among the way stations to where we are now. The pandemic is a world-changing event, to be sure. We're all experiencing that change. It's touched every aspect of our lives, the world over. But more than that, the pandemic has brought us face-to-face -face with the pervasive inequalities at all levels of society, local, national, and global. And yet, even as we face a series of quintessentially global interconnected crises, health, economy, climate change, migration, security, I could go on, we also face increasingly inward-looking authoritarian tendencies around the world, challenging the post-World War II international order and its multilateral moorings. So what about international law and all of that? The challenges are legion. Many of the issues we struggle with today don't mesh easily with international law's traditional state-focused concepts and approaches. What to do with transnational corporations, global terror networks, mass migration, or for that matter, highly infectious globally spreading diseases. States could tackle these problems together, of course, and they should, but that requires from a law perspective, sovereign consent. So does treaty making. The climate regime's painfully slow progress illustrates the difficulties of creating binding obligations at a global scale among states with vastly different outlooks, capacities, and priorities. On top of it, in the last few years, we've also seen key Western states withdraw from agreements and in international organizations. The United Kingdom from the EU, the United States from the Paris Agreement, the Iran nuclear deal, the International Postal Union, and most recently, in the midst of the pandemic from the World Health Organization. But what worries me more than key states turn away from multilateralism is their increasingly cavalier, and you might even say hostile attitude vis-a-vis -vis the very idea of international law. Consider the current debate in the United Kingdom about violating the EU withdrawal agreement that the same government concluded only a year ago. Or take the Trump administration as attacked core international rules, not just by violating them, one example, the assassination of Qasem Soleimani in Iraq earlier this year, but also by offering either obviously absurd, from a legal standpoint, justifications, or none at all. So my concern is with the bigger patterns. If occasional lapses turn into a pattern, then it's not just a given rule that's at risk, but the entire international legal order. Respect for international law and the expectation and insistence by others that actions will be justified against international law according to agreed standards for doing so convincingly, that is, in my view, what accounts for the existence of international law. International law is not a thing, I'd say no law is. It's a practice, something that has to be collectively maintained. And I think that today we're at real risk of seeing that practice fray. And it's troubling that perhaps the gravest challenges come from erstwhile supporters of international law. I put to you that international law is falling from the West. 
And that's been going on for a while. After the end of the Cold War, Western states overplayed their hand, offering strained justifications for what in fact were breaches of international law. The NATO intervention in Kosovo in 1999 were commentators mused about illegality but legitimacy. The second Gulf War in 2003, vaguely justified in light of 9-11 deposing Gaddafi in Libya in 2011, and various interventions in Syria from 2014 onwards in the name of rooting out terrorists. Now, none of this is to say that, take Russia or China, that there are angels, they're not. Right? But they and other states have long seen powerful Western states shape and then bend international law to their ends. And with shifting geopolitical dynamics, they have followed suit. The invasion and annexation of Crimea by Russia in 2014, just one example. And they've also sought to move international law back to a slim sovereignty protecting order, so cleansing it of human rights ambitions and so on. And they've not missed opportunities to accuse the West of double standards and with some justification. And still two, don't, two wrongs don't make a right, of course, but the real problem, again, is that this growing pattern of wrongs undermines the shared basis on which we've op been operating since World War II. And it deprives us of even minimal agreed standards for assessing what is right and wrong in the first place. And law then is eventually replaced with might as right. Something I think we can also actually see being pursued by some at the domestic level actively undermining society's capacity to even agree on facts. Now, all of that sounds pretty grim, and it is. And I come from a country where a similar breakdown of social consensus led to unspeakable horrors, and that's why I am so sensitive to and concerned about the patterns that I observe. So why then am I even a little optimistic? Well, I see a number of developments converging to prompt us to move in the right direction. Authoritarian populist leaders, for one thing, have not actually done very well running things. And so in some countries, the pendulum has swung back. In others, it's about to. I'll go out on a limb here and assume that the United States will have a new president as of January 2021. That won't solve all our problems, but it will, I think, very quickly change global political dynamics, including support for multilateralism. And so while the so-called alliance for multilateralism that was launched by France and Germany, two middle powers, alone could not succeed in a world of rising superpower tension, it can succeed with the US back on board. And even great power cooperation could return. Recall that only in 2015, not long ago, the United States and China worked together to make the Paris Agreement happen. And in fact, China just now announced a plan to be climate neutral by 2060. The EU has already pledged to be there by 2050. And if there is a change in government in the United States, there is a plan for the United States to go there in 2050. So I suggest that things can change for the better pretty quickly. We've also come back before, from the devastation of two world wars came the United Nations. Now, 2020 has not brought us a war. We can all be grateful for that. But the pandemic is a major jolt and it is global. And this I think is a key point. 2020 is not just a, about a Western sense of triumph like 1989 or a Western sense of crisis like 2001. It is a truly global crisis, like climate change, only more sudden. And so the pandemic has been a merciless teacher. It showed us how deeply unequal our world is at home and around the globe, how vulnerable our societies are and how interconnected the world is in every respect. And I think the pandemic has also been an effective teacher. It has shown us that survival depends on collaboration within countries and globally, and it shows us not only that we have to work together to solve a problem, but we actually can make a difference when we work together, take social distancing, mask wearing, and so on. It's also shown us, I think, that good governments matter. And finally, it has shown us that, at least in countries like Canada, behavior can be changed and enormous resources can be mobilized almost overnight. So the trite is true. 
crisis is an opportunity to build back better, to use the popular slogan, at least among politicians. And but that some of that is already happening, um, building a more just economy. So Germany, among other countries, has announced a guaranteed income experiment. Um, many countries are thinking about moving to green recovery and launching the massive changes that we must make to turn things around on the climate front. And then we might be pushed to re-engage with international institutions and international law because we need them to overcome the challenges that we've just been brought face to face with. So I don't think that international law can change us, but I do think that we've seen so much unraveling in short order, not one event, but a series of interconnected events since about 2016, that many of us are now acutely aware of the thin ice on which we are moving and aware that we need international law as a shared language for dealing with the global challenges that we face. It's far from perfect, but I would put to you, it's indispensable. And with those opening thoughts, I'll hand it over to Lavanya. Thank you, Yuta, also for your very generous introduction. A warm hello to my fellow panelists and to you all. It's a pleasure to be part of this terrific group of scholars on this panel, and I'm looking forward to uh, an enriching discussion afterwards. So Yuta, Professor Brunet ended on a much needed and indeed tantalizing note of optimism for what the future might bring and the role that international law might play in that. I'm also optimistic, but much more cautiously so than Yuta is. This may in part be due to the fact that I work primarily on in international environmental law and climate change law in particular, where the drivers and trends on climate change and biodiversity loss in particular place us on the edge of a precipice. On climate change, recent data indicates the past five years collectively have been the warmest years in modern record, with 20 of the warmest years occurring over the past 22 years. And this represents a consistent and incontrovertible warming trend. Emissions of greenhouse gases are at record levels, and at these levels, the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change predicts severe, pervasive, and irreversible impacts. On biodiversity loss, the 2020 Global Biodiversity Outlook, which was released a few weeks ago and was disturbingly titled Humanity at Crossroads, finds that not only is the world unlikely to meet any of the Aichi biodiversity targets in 2020, but also that there are significantly worsening trends in relation to the drivers of biodiversity loss. More broadly, on a range of environmental issues, the 2020 Global Environmental Outlook finds the world is not on track to achieving the environmental dimensions of the UN SDGs, the Sustainable Development Goals by 2030, or to delivering long-term sustainability by 2050. So the central message across a slew of recent scientific reports then is that current patterns of production and consumption, lifestyles, population growth and technological developments are just not sustainable. And in the face of such mounting evidence of human impact on the environment, to be optimistic, would take a monumental triumph of hope over evidence. So you can see why I might hold back. Uh, Margaret Atwood in the eerily prescient Mad, Mad Adam trilogy asks the questions at the core of our current environmental crisis. What if we continue down the road we're already on? How slippery is the slope? What are our saving graces? Who's got the will to stop us? Let me try and answer these in the context of the discussions we're having today and picking up some of the themes that Yuta has been alluding to in her talk. What if we continue down the road we're already on? How slippery is the slope? So that at one degree temperature rise that we are already seeing, we are facing record breaking storms, forest fires, droughts, coral bleaching, heat waves, and floods around the world. It was California today, Australia, over their black summer, and we're on track to a three degree temperature rise. So brace yourself. If you continue down this road, there's more to come. On biodiversity, we're facing the sixth mass extinction of species. One million plant and animal species are likely to disappear, forever changing the world we leave to our children. And how slippery is the slope? It's an extremely slippery slope. Scientists tell us we're already at various natural tipping points beyond which environmental harms get exponentially worse, threatening the health and ultimate survival of humanity. And the COVID crisis, 
Well, some actually see it as a reflection of our profoundly altered relationship with the natural environment. And it underscores the consequences of biodiversity loss and ecosystem degradation for human health, well-being, and survival. And sadly, it is an omen of things to come on climate change. COVID has also, as Yuta has pointed out, exposed the fragility of our systems and demonstrated that abrupt change, seismic disruptions, whether they're pandemic diseases or climate shifts, will ultimately affect the poor, marginalized, and vulnerable the most. And it's not just seismic natural disruptions, but the measures taken to address them as well that will affect the marginalized the most. Many of us saw the heartbreaking images of millions of migrant workers walking hundreds of miles back to their rural homes, some losing their lives in the process when the lockdown hit in India. So what are our saving graces? Yuta listed some of these saving graces, I have a yes, but response to most of them. Yes, but. <laughs> so the COVID crisis has demonstrated the ability of governments to intervene decisively and at scale. And Yuta pointed this out in her remarks. Yes, it has. But certainly some governments have done much better than others, usually led by women. This is not just instinct speaking, it's actually backed by recent research. The governments led by women governed much better and more decisively through the crisis. And we've seen the crucial importance of good governance to outcomes, and we can't take it for granted. So yes, some governments have intervened decisively and at scale, but not all governments, and we can't take it for granted. The COVID crisis has also demonstrated the ability of the international community to come together and collaborate to fight a common evil. Again, yes, it has, but not all governments and not all the time. And we've seen this with the US withdrawal from the World Health Organization, the anti-lockdown protests that have erupted around the world, efforts to corner the vaccines that are being developed and even hack into systems and steal them. So yes, we have demonstrated an ability as an international community to come together, but there are serious restrictions on that. The COVID crisis has also demonstrated our ability to make fundamental and painful behavioral changes. Yuta pointed to this as well. Yes, it has, but to be honest, who amongst us is not thinking longingly of a return to normality? A life in which we can nip across continents to see family celebrate milestone birthdays, have beach vacations in the middle of a dreary gray winter, and one in which, frankly, our kids go to school and we go to work and don't sit in our living rooms working. And let's not forget that some of these changes have been for the worse as far as the environment is concerned. It took decades for the messaging on single use plastics to seep through our consciousness. And in one fell swoop, COVID has reversed decades of progress on plastics and single use plastics in particular and waste. So single use plastics and waste are back. Some behavioral changes that have occurred in this time have helped the environment. Yes, they have but the effects are largely temporary. So the worldwide lockdowns, which confined people to their homes and shuttered businesses, did result in a temporary downturn in greenhouse gas emissions, up to 17%, according to a recent Nature report, but emissions are climbing again. In fact, it's been characterized as a rapid rebound as lockdowns are lifted. And COVID disruption more centrally could create a serious and potentially fatal drag on global efforts to address climate change. The postponement of the 2020 annual climate negotiations by a year is merely the tip of the iceberg. The ambitious commitments, actions, policies, and measures needed to trigger and sustain emissions reductions in line with the 2015 Paris Agreement's well below two degrees centigrade temperature limit grow ever further from reach. Many nations are tackling the deepest recession they have faced in a generation. India's economy, for instance, shrank by 24% in 2020. Momentum is gathering across the world, and this is a saving grace, as Yuta points out, for a green recovery and to build back better. But whether states will in the process of economic recovery, notwithstanding the lip service that they might pay to green recovery or build back better, whether states will actually entrench the reliance on fossil fuels or take the opportunity to transform their economies towards net zero emissions remains to be seen. India, for instance, opened up 41 coal mining blocks to private bids in June this year and has weakened regulations systematically on environmental impact assessments. 
and is no means the only country to roll back environmental regulations in response to the crisis. So finally, who's got the will to stop us? International law and the international community. Utah suggests that it's international law and the international community that should do this. It is imperfect, and I, I can certainly agree with that, and it's all we have, um, and I don't disagree. But again, a note of caution, as Utah points out as well, international law is comprised of sovereign states that are deeply protective of their autonomy. And the climate negotiations do demonstrate that quite starkly. The 2015 climate agreements built around nationally determined contributions by states, not internationally negotiated contributions, nationally determined contributions. And they don't add up. They put us on a three degree, over three degree, temperature rise pathway, not 1.5, not well below two. There are also persistent inequalities between states, those living in developing developing countries and those living within those countries too. Many developing countries have yet to eradicate poverty and to provide energy access to all. An estimated 1.1 billion people, that's 14% of the world population do not have access to electricity. And an estimated 700 million people, predominantly in Sub-Saharan Africa, are projected to remain without electricity in 2040. Needless to say, this affects the dynamics of negotiations on global public goods and the limits of what the international community, tied to the least common denominator among disparate states, can achieve. There are very real limits to what we can achieve at the international level. So if it's not predominantly or principally the international community and international law, who's got the will to stop us? National politicians with vision, not easy to find, given the mismatch between medium and long-term harm and short-term electoral cycles. We see plenty of evidence of this. Is it us? Do we have the will to stop us? Do we have the will to drive the change? Maybe some of us do, but there's also so much apathy. People are actually out of outrage. They're bombarded with images of starving polar bears and wildfires. We were talking about crossroads 20 years ago, they say. If it hasn't happened then, maybe it won't. Maybe technology will save us. Maybe geoengineering will save us. Maybe we don't have to change our lifestyles. So who's got the will to stop us? Perhaps the young, the school strikes across the world, the extinction rebellion. Yes, they have the will and the voice, but none of the power. And by the time they do have the power, it may be far too late. So yes, again, we're left with the question, who's got the will to stop us? And there's really no clear answer to that. But it brings me back to Utah's turning point or humanity at crossroads. We are at these crossroads, not because of COVID. Certainly COVID has added an additional wrinkle in the mix and it is an omen of things to come, but because of the mechanics of our life on earth over the last several decades. What we need is transformative change involving all states, sectors of the economy and across the full gamut of stakeholders and actors. We all need the will to stop us. I agree with Yuta that we have an opportunity to build back better and not go back to the normality that we all crave and long for. That has actually brought us to this brink. But what role can international law play in this? It's fundamentally limited as it is, based as it is on sovereign states and consent, as Yuta pointed out. So what we need from international law is a fundamental reset of its premises, conceptual pillars, and mechanisms for it to be fit for environmental purpose, fit for addressing the planetary boundaries that are ever so quickly approaching. And this reset requ requires imagination, imagination that is both outrageous in its ambition and that is fueled by outrage. What shape this reset takes and whether we have that outrageous imagination and will remains to be seen. I'm gonna leave it there. So not as optimistic a note as Yuta ended on, sadly, but hopefully Alonzo, Professor Alonzo de Gourmendi will have a nicer note to end on. Alonzo. Hi, uh, thank you, Lavanya, and thank you, Yuta, for, for this invitation. It is a pleasure to be here and share this panel with you. I have uh, listened with great interest to two uh, fantastic presentations. Um, I 
I was introduced on, on the notion of hopefully I'll be a little bit more optimistic and I think I will share uh, the idea of I am optimistic but not as much and I hope I don't bring the, the mood through down with what I'm going to say. <laughs> um, so let me start from, from going back to where Utah left us. Um, the idea that uh, COVID has been a merciless teacher because this is a, a global crisis and for the first time a global crisis and not uh, Western uh, defeat or, or victory as the fall of the Berlin Wall or 9-11 or and how we've been made aware of the thin ice that we're walking in, to quote, uh, and the idea of inequality, vulnerability, and interconnectedness being at the heart of this lesson. Uh, I want to share on the optimism of we can build, build back better, uh, but I think the, change, the exact terms on which this optimism is built, I don't fully agree with. I would, I would choose different terms. Uh, because I think, and this was very clear from, from Lavagna's, Professor Rajamani's uh, presentation, uh, there are limitations, important limitations. And in my case, the limitations that I want to talk about deal a little bit more with the game, quote unquote, that countries play, which was the, the last part of Professor Rajamani's uh, presentation. Uh, I do not believe that it is the crisis itself. I do not believe that it is the fact that COVID is existing and making us aware of things that is gonna make us change. I mean, us as the international community. I rather, I am very skeptical of claims about globalization um, as COVID as the global crisis. Uh, it is geographically affecting all of the world. But the world isn't truly globalized. I think capital is globalized. I think the West as a an, geographical area is globalized. But there are parts of the world where globalization has not reached for humans. It might have reached for investment and capital, but not for humans. This is why we see uh, so many refugee crises. If, if the world were tr truly globalized for humans, then there would not be the need of a, of a refugee crisis. Um, individuals fleeing uh, uh, Syria or, or Central America uh, into Europe or the US would not need to get on boats if a person from one member of the European Union feels that their life is not right in the, in the European Union in that country, they simply travel to the next one without any problems. The experience of being an illegal, quote unquote, illegal immigrant in the world is, is very different. Uh, being Peruvian, I, I know very well the situation of American journalists who come to Peru and other South American countries to work on a tourist visa. And that is undocumented illegal immigration, but for them it's an anecdote. It's a story you tell in a, um, a, a, over coffee. Whereas for a Latin American to illegally immigrate to the United States, it, it implies family separation, it implies uh, concentration camps, it implies human trafficking, it is a, a life and death situation. So COVID, I, I, I would say it's a crisis that affects the entire world, but it's not a, a function of globalization. Uh, we will see how this crisis is not globally solved as well. We are already seeing countries like the United States and the United Kingdom buying the most stocks for the vaccine. The vaccine will be unevenly distributed. We are seeing the kinds of debates in Germany and the UK about subsidizing furloughed workers uh, don't exist in the global south. Countries cannot simply subsidize their entire economy uh, and there is no effort to help them do this. Basically, what we're looking at is a massive, perhaps the greatest reduction in GDP growth for uh, global south and developing countries ever that will go in many cases bankrupt with the West simply moving forward. Uh, it's the difference between a bump and a crash. So there are different lessons being learned all over the world. Uh, there, and it's not a uniform lesson. While the West might be thinking about this green recovery, building back better through green recovery, and whether the great power politics of, uh, needs to yield towards international cooperation, 
that is not the same lesson that is being learned in the global south where right now the main idea is we are incapable we as the, the global south countries are incapable of funding public health services that are up to the challenge of a pandemic just in 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 latin america and south america uh, health services were already collapsed before the venezuelan refugee crisis and before covid so we're seeing a double collapse of of public health so that is a, a different kind of lesson and i do not expect as well the game that is being played this idea of sovereign states playing for power uh, of great power politics changing either um, people will not and states will not abandon it just because the pandemic is showing us how silly it is to play this game the game will continue to be played even if participants are made aware of its silliness uh, we are also seeing that right now with uh, with the U.S. approach to vaccines that I mentioned, and also uh, Russia speeding up process for its own vaccine to be the savior, to, to promote it and, and use it in other countries, despite the fact that it is uh, likely not ready. It, is, it has not finished all phase three uh, testing. Uh, and we are seeing how countries like China and the United States are already engaging in this politics politics dynamic over who is to blame for the pandemic. Um, so I do not think that it is COVID that will be the teacher. I think COVID uh, can show us things, but just like the fall of the Berlin Wall and the 9-11 uh, showed us things, I think it is possible, uh, I would say even probable, that um, things will go back to normal um, without addressing the lessons that COVID has shown us. So my uh, my thought process here is let's try and go back to the last time that quote unquote the game changed and uh, this has come up as well in in these presentations a hundred years ago we faced the most similar like crisis possible world war one plus the spanish flu and i do think that a hundred years ago the game was played differently coming from south america a hundred years ago, a little over a hundred years ago, in 1902, when Venezuela owed money, like owed foreign debt to European powers, it was perfectly acceptable under international law to send gunboats and a fleet of ships to blockade the ports of Venezuela and collect that debt, simply bombard and occupy Venezuelan ports and uh, basically take Venezuelan taxpayer money to account for uh, foreign debt. That no longer happens. And no matter how unfair international economic law institutions are right now, and no matter how one-sided, it would be unthinkable for France to invade Mexico and appoint uh, an emperor, as happened in, 18, in the 1800s. So that was a change in how the game was played. So I'm, I'm interested in looking at how that happened where did that change come from? And from the pages of the Global North and the West, uh, I usually see this change in the game as the product of uh, the Kellogg-Rian pact negotiations. Um, there's this excellent book by Scott Shapiro and Luna Hathaway on, on called The Internationalists that tells the story of how uh, it was US um, isolationists that led to the creation of the Kellogg-Brien Pact and therefore the legal um, outruling of, of war as a tour of foreign, foreign policy. That is correct, that is one of the paths through which this happened, but there was another one that came from the Global South that was a periphery claim by recently uh, independent countries in Latin America that had just joined the international community and had all of these other ideas as to how to organize world society, trying to produce a world where uh, the concert of powers did not rule in foreign affairs, but rather sovereign equality. And it was a long process. It, it started uh, with uh, the Dragon Calvo doctrines about a forceful collection of debts in the late 1800s, early 1900s. It, it went along uh, to 1907 in the Hague Convention with uh, Ambassador Rui Barbosa from Brazil defending the principle of sovereign equality uh, before European powers. Uh, the 1928 Havana Convention, um, where uh, the ground was set for the 
ground shifting 1933 Montevideo Convention, where state equality and the right of a country to uh, control its own affairs was recognized. Uh, the independence of states was recognized un under treaty. Uh, the Act of Chapultepec, the writings of Roque Sanz Peña, the writings of, of uh, Pueyrredon, the, all of these thinkers that moved the discussion in a way that was different from the way the game was played. And so here's where I am interested in seeing how we can learn from that process, that periphery-led process that led to actual change in the game. And I see much parallel, uh, and here I'm, I'm um, uh, joining uh, Professor Rajamani's uh, final thoughts, uh, I see much connection with movements of uh, Black Lives Matter, the decolonized movement and TWAIL as a, as a means of shifting the structures upon which this community of sovereign states rests that might help change how the game, how international law is perceived at a more fundamental level than any sort of lesson from COVID might produce. I feel, and, and I am, I feel that the idea that uh, it is young people without power that, that believe this has some truth to it, but at the same time, I think there, they are also intellectual movements that are at the heart of the knowledge producing centers of the world and that have the benefit of momentum to their side. So my optimism, instead of coming from reaction to a crisis, comes from, from seeing these structural patterns, these this ideas that come from the bottom up, that have the potential to change the way we approach international law, if only we give them the opportunity, if only we are able to make them come out of this um, site headline in the newspaper as riots in the United States and, uh, and, and make them part of our discourse. And so I, instead of putting my hope in the COVID crisis, I want to put my hopes on the statues that are falling all over the world. And with this in mind, I, I give the, the microphone back to, to Sarah for, for continuing with the, with the event. Thank you. Thank you all. Thanks to all of the panelists for such thoughtful reflections on international law in this present moment. Um, I see that there's one question from the audience right now. And we've got a couple of others that are coming through. So I just encourage all of you who are listening to send your questions in using the question and answer function so that I can ask them to the, the panelists. The first question I'll uh, ask of Professor Rajamani. This is from Daniel Marin, who's a JD student at Osgoode Hall Law School in Toronto. And Daniel was asked or commented and asked, from what he sees, we've seen a lack of multilateralism grounded on principles of international law in responding to climate change and COVID-19. Are there any practices or principles under public international law or customary international law that can strengthen global efforts to address both the pandemic and climate change, or at least hold states accountable that do not abide by international health guidelines, for instance, from the World Health Organization or environmental protocols like the Paris Agreement, how can international law effectively balance the principle of state sovereignty in responding to both crises at once? So that's a very big question for you, but I take it it's primarily aimed at the relationship between COVID-19 and climate change. And I think you alluded to that in your comments somewhat in terms of talking about the interdependence of people in the natural world mm -hmm. and how that is connected to the prospects for international law um, as a mode of negotiation between sovereign states. Okay, uh, thank you, Sarah. And thank you, uh, Daniel, for that very interesting question. I think there are um, several elements to the question that you ask, and I'm going to address them sort of separately. I'd uh, like to address the first part, which is on the principle 
uh, principles that might help and practices of international law and, uh, and custom that might help potentially. And the second part, which is about the accountability of states uh, where they don't conduct themselves in a way uh, that international law would, uh, would dictate or suggest or at least create a normative pull towards. So as for the first part of the question, there are principles uh, of customary international law that could uh, that play a role here. So treaty law, as we discussed and Yuta discussed as well, is fundamentally limited uh, to some extent because the uh, negotiations are tied to the least common denominator between various different states. And treaty law is fundamentally also dependent on consent, state consent, um, as is customary international law, but treaty law more directly. So we've seen in the climate change negotiations, for instance, um, the US under President Obama uh, sort of fundamentally shaped the deal that was struck in 2015. And shortly uh, thereafter, the US announced its withdrawal, which will come into effect this November. So uh, treaty law has fundamental limitations in terms of addressing, uh, addressing some of these planetary level crises that we're talking about. There are principles of customary international law that are also grounded in consent of states in the evolution of these principles, like the principle of harm prevention that Yuta is sort of a world authority on, um, principle of harm prevention. So I'll let her talk to that uh, as well, but um, uh, uh, fundamentally requiring states to exercise due diligence in preventing transboundary environmental harm. Um, but it is also a principle that is limited in some ways because it is a due diligence obligation and it's an obligation of conduct, not an obligation of result. Um, so it is limited uh, as well, but there are options beyond treaty law in that sense, uh, if we are trying to get some sort of uh, pull towards uh, sort of better behavior from states as it were. As for the accountability question, I think fundamentally this is, uh, this is a challenge in international law and to be able to address it, we need to go beyond the traditional mechanisms of accountability. So under treaty law, of course, the mechanisms of accountability uh, would be various sort of monitoring and review uh, processes. There might be compliance mechanisms. The Kyoto Protocol had a fairly robust compliance mechanism and the Paris Agreement has one too, but it is a facilitative mechanism. So there are processes and mechanisms of accountability under treaties. Outside treaties though, um, I think fundamentally the accountability comes from the international community and the accountability comes not just from state actors, but comes from non-state actors. And we see this in the context of uh, the Paris Agreement, which fundamentally because of the kinds of contestations there were, could not agree um, on reviewing the adequacy within the regime of the ambition of states' contributions uh, in relation to climate change. So the process has opened up to take views uh, from um, non-state actors, for instance, that, uh, that actually perform these adequacy review functions in terms of the contribution states make. So we have the climate action tracker and various other non-state mechanisms of holding states to account for the contributions that they make. So um, again, in terms of imagining international law outside the box, we need to go beyond the state run and state uh, sort of directed mechanisms to look outside for accountability. Thank you. Wonderful. Thank you, Professor Rajamani. And we've got a number of questions that are flowing in now. Um, we have one from Ling Cheng, who I understand is an SGD student at the McGill Faculty of Law. Um, and here uh, he's pushing back a little bit on the theme of optimism and the prospects for international law and also building on Professor Rajamani's uh, reference to resetting international law. Um, and considering that theme of the question, I think I'll ask it of Professor Brunet. Uh, so Ling has asked, I understand that the possible change of administration in the US may quickly bring positives to the dynamics in multilateralism and international law. But what if the current administration stays? How can we still be optimistic about international law? Will it be a turning moment to reset the premises of international law and imagine a different international law? For instance, shifting to transnational law. 
Thank you, Ling, for that question. Um, nice to uh, hear from you in, uh, in this way. The world is very small. Ling was at one point an LLM student here at U of T, so I actually know the questioner. Um, so that's a very good question. And um, of, you know, there is a certain amount of irony in the fact that as the German on the panel, I'm the optimist. <laughs> I did that in part um, to get our discussion going and get us thinking, uh, uh, you know, I think uh, that it's, it's difficult to see positive things on the horizon when we're so mired in crisis as we are every, every day. But it does seem to me that, um, that the kinds of things that I've pointed out and, you know, are, are reasons why um, something better um, may be possible. And um, I'm, I guess I'm also encouraged by the fact that um, we've, we, as in humans, have been there before, right, in really bad places where um, only dire predictions obtained um, and um, we've improved as a result of the lessons learned from that and, um, um, you know, the, the World War One example, I guess, is one um, where uh, the, the, and then certainly after World War Two, the world went into a very long period of progress and prosperity, although I think rightly pointed out by both Lavagna and Alonso, um, seen from a certain vantage point, right? So I think the best that can be said for the world globally was that the incidence of war and violence around the world went down, um, but um, that's probably also even more true for, for Western states. And when there was war, more often than not, Western states were involved in some way. Now, to answer your question, Ling, so first of all, I do want to, um, maybe sidestep it a little and say, so assuming I'm right, and there is a new US administration, then I wonder, maybe I can bring Lavanya back in, into this. Um, I see that not everything is great in the climate regime. I see that we are um, in, on a not very good trajectory as far as greenhouse gas emissions and the progression of climate change are concerned. But it also seems to me that if it is, so if we now have this signal from China that it will become carbon neutral by 2060. Um, and in fact, Ling might know more about how seriously we should take that, um, being originally from China. If the EU is already on tr at least committed to that, and I think they're also about or have legislated that in some way, and if the United States were to join in, we have the major carbon emitters um, on at least notionally the right trajectory. And so I was interested um, listening to a podcast from The Economist of all things last week saying that that could actually, if it is taken seriously, bring us um, within back within the 1.5 degree trajectory. So I'll leave it for Lavanya perhaps in a moment to pour cold, cold water on that. But it seems to me that these kind of big signals are important. And so um, the, and as far as the Paris Agreement is concerned, the United States re-engaging, I think, will return the momentum into the regime. And then I totally agree with Lavanya and also Alonso that this isn't just a matter of the big states somehow making things happen amongst each other. It's a matter of sending signals to actors at all levels, including us as individuals, right? So you kept asking quite rightly, Lavanya, um, who's, what was your formulation? Who's, who's got the will? Who's got the will? So this is the problem, right? We all have to look at ourselves in the mirror. It's not somebody else who's going to solve the problem. It's not somebody else who creates the problem. It's all of us. And, and that's where I would still take um, the COVID example as showing that it shows us the, the difficulties of moving in the same direction, but it also shows us that if we all do even relatively basic things collectively, we can make a big difference. Now, I'm not completely avoiding your question, Ling, although it's a very difficult one. Um, so if there is no change in government in the United States, I, I, I think what I've mapped out is still possible, but it will be a whole lot more difficult because we don't have that momentum change um, that, that I've described. And so I think um, uh, we would then have to rely on many of the same things we've already put on the table, this multi-level action, thinking outside the box um, in the climate context, for example, increasingly there being resort to litigation where individuals or groups or sub-state units try and push things um, in, in the right direction. So, but that's all the more difficult, right? If you then collective action, if it, 
it needs everybody at all levels working together. But if if it would be a lot easier if there was some state level signal setting. So I'm 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 not suggesting um, that uh, that would not so that that if there is no change in government, I think we're not in terribly good shape. Um, and it would be a lot harder for, say, France and Germany to push the alliance for multilateralism and all those kinds of things um, forward. So um, that's the best I can say right now. Can I just jump in, Sarah, on the point that Jutta raised um, on, thank you, on, um, on the sort of signals that we've been getting from the EU and China and the uh, hope that things will change in the US. I think, um, I think what we need are long-term strategies for how we get there. And while it's possible to make commitments that are 30, 40 years from now, I mean, that fits within shorter term electoral cycles. It sort of, it, it, it satisfies everybody. But uh, if we actually have long-term trajectories that, sh that see us sort of ex overshooting quite dramatically and then postponing for the youth that we're talking about, the ones that will have the power in 20, 30 years, um, if you're postponing for them all the really expensive, hard, difficult choices. So it's up to us, right? So it's yeah, exactly. not it to be up to us. lawyers, it's up to everybody. It's, it's up to us now to make these changes. And right now we're not seeing sort of a steep decline. What we're seeing is promises that we'll make these declines in 10, 15, 20 years and eventually get back to net zero, right? And a lot of these pathways are also contingent on using uh, sort of, you know, uh, various geoengineering and uh, carbon removal options. Uh, some of those technologies have not yet been, um, oh, well, entirely proven, at least we don't know whether they can be deployed at scale. So I think there are lots of ifs and buts, and I don't, again, want to sort of uh, uh, introduce a note of caution into your sort of positive uh, take, Yuta, but I think there are lots of ifs and buts on that long-term trajectory. What we see now are increasing emissions and what we see, I mean, post-pandemic increasing emissions, and we need sort of urgent action to be taken now. Uh, which, uh, which uh, you know, I think the latest IPCC reports that are also going to come out uh, will just testify to the fact that all the indicators are, uh, are sort of negative on that front. Um, as for the US, um, um, I mean, I think when, when Trump uh, first uh, uh, sort of won the election in the first term, uh, a lot of us in the climate change process thought, well, you know, even if he withdraws right away, it's got four years because of the entry into force provisions. But back at, at that time, we thought, well, four years that the climate change regime could actually tolerate this disruption. But a second term, you know, it would be impossible because, you know, people can, and governments and states and non-state actors, there's only so far they can go uh, in terms of, you know, uh, doing things under the radar and outside the state. There's a limit to how much you can do that. So a second term would be disastrous for the climate change regime. And so most of us don't want to think about it. So don't ask us what if. <laughs> Okay, so the next question I'll direct at Professor Grimendi, and this comes from Mark Searchin, who is a U of T law graduate uh, from 1981, and is also an adjunct professor at uh, U of T in the GP LLM program, focusing on corporate debt finance. Mark asks, when you look at 100 years ago, Many states' peoples were coming out of monarchies and turning to democracy, including empires being broken up into nation states. Is this time not different, as many peoples actually feel that the old liberal order and multilateralism have failed them, as shown by the success of Trump? So perhaps you could relate this a little bit as well to your comments on uh, the changing game and also social movements, bottom-up movements, um, such as BLM, Black Lives Matter. Yes, thank you, Sarah. And, and thank you to Professor Searching for, for this um, question. So I, I would not really uh, consider both moments 100 years ago and today as entirely separate moments. I think one is the product of the other. If you uh, take a look at how uh, the process of 
decolonization or, or the collapse of the Spanish Empire in, in Latin America uh, occurred, uh, it set out the conditions for the system that we have today. Uh, in, in much of the, the post-colonial world, the structures left in place create the world that, that is now today um, leaving people feeling as if, as if the liberal world order has failed them and therefore the success of Trump. That is, um, uh, it is part of the, of the same process. When monarchies collapsed um, in, during those in independence years, uh, it, it was also, there was also a discussion of the system, the monarchy has failed people, uh, people in the, in the peripheral uh, parts of, of colonies, uh, like in, in Latin America, which is the context that I know best, uh, would be Argentina, Venezuela, uh, the, the, the groups um, of uh, the colonies over there were, were thinking the system, monarchy has failed us. And there was a lot of resistance by other parts of, of the colonial empire that were pro-monarchy. And it was a similar discussion to the one we're having today. So I don't think that we should uh, do too harsh a, a distinction between 100 to 100 years ago and today. I think today, because there are so many people that feel that the world order has failed them, and I feel in many cases they are right, uh, there is potential to channel that frustration Instead of towards a Trump that, that, that says, okay, the international system has failed us, therefore let's hunker into sovereignty and, and get away from the world, to channel it into the kinds of movements that we are seeing being born right now, Black Lives Matter and, and the decolonized movement and TWAIL, that are also coming from voices, of, of, from voices saying the system is failing. So it's just, it's just a product of, of understanding that it's all interconnected. The system, the system's failure is interconnected. And we need to be able to challenge uh, the existing structures in constructive ways. There, there, there is such a thing as non-constructive um, challenge, uh, which would be the, the, the challenge that Trump gives out. So I don't think that it is an ex extremely different moment. I think the feeling of failure today can be channeled for good. Thank you very much again, Mark, for your question and Professor Gumendi for your answer. I'm aware that we're just past time now. And so as a way to close, before I turn it to um, Raquel from Alumni um, Affairs, I'm going to read out a final question from you, uh, Julian Huertas, who I believe is a, is a doctoral student at the University of Toronto Faculty of Law. And so perhaps we can all simply sit with this as an open question and respond in our ongoing conversations uh, apart from this particular Zoom question. So first, Julian thanks all the panelists for this terrific discussion and I would echo that uh, note of thanks. As Professor Brunet highlighted, the last few years, he says, and particularly 2020, resemble other years or periods that because of those crises, witnessed the emergence of new ways of thinking about international law, ideology, the economy, and legal philosophy. He asks to the three panelists, and let's extend that now to the audience as well, what do you think is the orientation of legal philosophical thought um, that will have to take place in the aftermath of this global crisis? So I'll leave you all with that and turn it over to Raquel to, to close off our session.